the Gospel of Mark really moves things along. You know, this is, this is the third chapter, but by the, by the third chapter, Jesus has uh, been baptized. He's been tempted in the wilderness. He's come out of the wilderness preaching that the kingdom of God is at hand. He's picked some disciples. He's healed Peter's mother-in-law. He's, um, he's gone off to pray. He's called some more disciples. He's, he's healed people on the Sabbath that gotten in trouble. Uh, he's had a confrontation about eating on the Sabbath. He's cast out some demons. He's called more disciples. Uh, and, then, and then he uh, heals some more people and he ca casts out some more demons. <sighs> and then we get to chapter 3, verse 20, that says, he entered a house. <sighs> he's had a busy business trip. He's been all over the place. He entered a house. Now, some translations say he entered a home. Other translations say he entered his home. That's kind of neat. You know, who thought Jesus had a home? He entered his home, and we know it's not his family's home because they're outside of it. He entered a home. I love the line in the, in the wedding service toward the end, the blessing of the, of the marriage, where it says, may your home be a haven of blessing and peace. I mean, isn't that what we want? A home that's a haven of blessing and peace where we can shut the door, put our feet up, take off our shoes, relax and not be bothered. Jesus comes home from this, don't we want that? Well, yeah, yeah. So he comes home from this business trip and he goes home and he's going to relax. No. The first thing that happens is his family shows up. His family, I mean, the phone starts ringing. The phone starts ringing. People are knocking on the door. You know, his family shows up. And they're not bringing casseroles. You know, they're not bringing videos for him. Your family is here. Because they think you're out of your mind. They think you're nuts. Other translations say, your family thinks you've gotten carried away with yourself. Now, there's family conflict here. And most times, when Jesus is mentioned with his family, there is family conflict. You can look it up. And, uh, you know, we know about family conflict. Jesus isn't growing up quite the way the family wanted him to be. Maybe they knew he was gonna be the Messiah, but he's not the kind of Messiah that, that they dreamed about. You know, he's, he's violating the Sabbath law. He's, he's having dinner with, with outcasts. He's having dinner with, with prostitutes and tax collectors and homeless people. He's not the kind of Messiah they wanted. You know, it's like, it's like a family where they have these great expectations that their child is going to grow up to be a doctor and the child's in medical school. And after the second year of medical school, the, the child comes home and says, I'm going to be an English major. What? <laughs> You're going to be an English major? No, no. You know, there's conflict here. Jeez, are you out of your mind? Are you out of your mind wanting to be an English major? You know, you're giving up engineering to go to art school? Come on, we didn't bring you up that way. You know, and we know about conflict with our families where you know, we might not live up to our family's expectations. You know, you might become a minister. Uh, or you might come out of the closet. You know, and the family, oh wait, I, I heard a speech uh, Wednesday where a, a lesbian was talking to a large gathering and she said, you know, my, my family always had this dream, particularly my mother, of me walking down the aisle in a nice white wedding gown. And I did, but she just wasn't expecting a woman to be waiting there for me. Yeah. So we know about this friction in families, and there is this friction in Jesus' family. They're trying to pull him back in so he'll be normal and he'll be, he'll be sane. In, in report to Greco, Kazan Zakis tells this story. It's a fantasy where Jesus, the young Jesus, uh, is having trouble sleeping at night. 
And, and Mary is bothered by Jesus' sleeplessness and his, his getting up and, and walking around the house and walking around the village because he can't sleep. And so she takes Jesus, the young Jesus, to the, to the local rabbi and says, you know, heal him, heal him. And, and the rabbi says, well, why can't you sleep at night? What's troubling you? And he says, I wrestle with God. I wrestle with God and I don't know what God wants to do with my life and I wrestle with that and I can't sleep. And the rabbi then starts to talk to him about, about what's normal and they, they go on long walks together and talk about sunrises and sunsets and they talk about you know, the, the village and they talk about young girls that are attractive that come to the well to get water. And after a couple of months, the rabbi has healed Jesus. He's healed Jesus, and Jesus can sleep at night, and he then becomes the best carpenter in Nazareth, and that's it. We never hear of Jesus again. What's sanity and what isn't? What's healthy and what isn't? Jesus' family is wrestling with that, and we wrestle with that. And then after the family's kind of quieted down, the next group shows up at Jesus' door and he still can't get to, get to put his feet up and he still can't have that pizza that he ordered. You know, these are the legal experts who have come to have a showdown with Jesus. They don't say he's out of his mind or is carried away with himself. They say he's demon-possessed. They say he's doing the work of the devil. You know? This is probably why Mary was worried about Jesus. Jesus is getting in trouble with the bishop and the district superintendents. They might be bringing him to a trial pretty soon. You know, come on, Jesus, rein it in. They think, the legal experts think he's demon-possessed. He's, he's, he's of Satan. He's of Beelzebul, the, the, the um, Canaanite god. And Jesus answers them with perfect logic. And he says, if I am of the devil, if I am of the demons, how is it that I can cast out demons? How is it that I am defeating demons? How is it that I'm freeing people from demon possession, from being obsessed, from being possessed, from being addicted, from being a slave to so many things? How is it that I'm freeing people from Satan's clutches? It doesn't make any sense. Um, it's kind of like saying, how can you say I'm a Michigan fan if I just gave $10 million to the Ohio State football team? That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't compute. How can you say I'm on the side of the enemy if I just killed so many, so many enemy soldiers in this battle? It doesn't make any sense. No, no, I am not on the side of the demons, when I cast out demons, when I forgive people, when I eat with, with sinners and tax collectors and the outcast, I'm not on the side of the demons, I'm on the side of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus then gets into this, this verse that's so troubling to so many people, where he talks about the unforgivable sin. All sins will be forgiven except one, the insult against the Holy Spirit. What is that? What is that? You know, what is the insult against the Holy Spirit? Well, what is the unforgivable sin? You know, you listen to some people and they'll say homosexuality is the unforgivable sin. You listen to somebody here and we would say being against homosexuality is the unforgivable sin. Yeah. Uh, others might say it's, um, it's, it's, it's uh, ignoring the poor. Others might say the unforgivable sin is, is child abuse. You know, what is the unforgivable sin? Well, Jesus says it's confusing the work of the Holy Spirit as demonic as demonic. Now that might seem strange, but 
Jesus, in these first three chapters where he goes at breakneck speed on this business trip through Galilee, he gives you a, a hint of what the Holy Spirit is for. It is for liberating people from their addic addictions and obsessions. It is freeing people from what keeps them bound and less human. It is forgiving people. It is letting people into the circle, letting the outcasts and the marginalized in. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And to call that demonic is the unforgivable sin. It's basically saying God is wrong. Jesus is wrong. We might say forgiving someone is demonic. And Jesus is saying no. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. We might say letting somebody in the circle is demonic. And Jesus is saying that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And it isn't that God doesn't forgive people. It's that people refuse to be forgiven. It's that they're stubborn. C.S. Lewis says the gates of hell are locked from the inside. It's that people will let, not let God into their lives and will not let the Holy Spirit into their lives. That they refuse to be forgiven. So Jesus settles this with the religious, religious experts, but no, he still can't rest. He still can't rest because his family's back at it. His family, you know, your family is outside the house and they're calling for you. House is a very strong image in this passage. Jesus comes to a house. He comes home. He comes to his home. And all this talk about binding Satan, Jesus uses a house imagery. And then, and then his family is standing outside the house. And you get this picture of Jesus inside the house and the family outside the house. Your family is outside the house waiting for you, calling you. This image of who's in the house and who isn't in the house is an important image, isn't it? Who's in the house? Who's outside the house? Um, we had a homeless person sleeping right outside the west door Friday night and Saturday night. Um, she came in this morning and took a shower and had coffee we helped her get a new shopping cart for her things. That's all she asked. Who's in the house and who isn't in the house? Um, it's not necessarily just GLBT persons that are inside or outside. It is the poor. It is the homeless. Um, it can be children. We're talking about including children more in worship. Are they inside the house or are they outside the house? It's a big deal. We're going to sing Break Down the Wall soon. You know? Um, to go from the house image, just one other story um, on a house. This Wednesday, um, Sherry Kelly put together um, a program at the Defense Supply Center out on the East End. And um, it was for Pride, Pride Month. And they've never done that. They've never done any program for Pride at the Defense Supply Center. And um, I know about this because I was on the agenda. I did, I did the opening prayer. And uh, Carla Rothen from Stonewall did the main presentation. And, 
And it was so neat to have the deputy commander get up before, after my prayer and before Carla's speech and just say, you know, the military has kind of led the way in many ways for inclusion in this country with blacks and in integrating the army, um, with women, and with GLBT persons. And I thought, how neat that they've drawn the, they're inviting people into the house, that they're including people in the house. This story ends with the image, not of a house, but of a circle. And it says, your family is outside the house calling for you. And then it says, Jesus said to those who were sitting around him in a circle. You get this picture of Jesus in the center of a circle and people sitting around him. They're in the circle, as the opening song said, not because of their gender, not because of their race, not because of their nationality, not because of their blood relationship to Jesus, not because of anything other than that they do the will of, the, of God, that they do the will of God. That's what gets one into the house. That's what gets one into the circle. Are you doing the will of God? And when Jesus does away with all those other labels, he's expanded the circle really wide. But what interests me is that Jesus is in the center of the circle. So if I want to look at somebody on the other side of the circle that I don't like and I don't totally approve of, I have to look through Jesus to see him. Yeah. Jesus is the center, not me. And one of my problems is the lack of humility, the thinking, I'm the center. It's those who do the will of God and we look through Jesus to see the other person. And when we look through Jesus to see the other person, we see the other person differently. One last point. The beginning verse says, Jesus came home to eat. He came home to eat. The actual word is, he came home to eat bread. He came home to eat bread. And people were around him, and he wanted to eat bread with them. But there were all these distractions that kept him from eating bread. And the distractions were basically saying, you're accepting the unworthy. You're accepting the unworthy. These people cannot eat bread with you. Well, who is worthy to eat bread with Jesus? Is Chris? No. <laughs> is Colleen? Absolutely not. Am I? Not even I. The question isn't, the question isn't who's worthy? Because as soon as we ask that question, we put ourselves in the center of the circle. The question is, who's hungry? Who's hungry? Who's hungry for forgiveness? Who's hungry for acceptance? Who's hungry for love? Who's hungry for mercy? That's the question. And Jesus says, all are welcome to eat bread with me. Come and be satisfied. May it be so. Amen.